This is Bishop John with a homily from Friar Doc for Palm Sunday. Um, the lessons this morning include one extra, which is the uh, gospel at the procession with the palms. And that one is Luke you know, chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Um, the Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verses 4 through 7. The you know, responsorial verse verses are from Psalm 22 verses 8 and 9, 17 and 18, 19 and 20, and 23 through 24. The epistle reading is from the uh, epistle to the Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 through 11 and the gospel is again from Luke uh, in this case uh, chapter 23 verses 1 through 49. They're a little long but uh, when you have a few moments sit down and read through all of them. Um, the lessons this Palm Sunday proclaim to us the majesty of our Lord and the unbelievably uh, careful preparation our Abba put into the final events of what might be called the infinite incarnation. God in man completing the perfect life according to the plan. There is little that occurred during the first Holy Week that, uh, that hadn't been foreseen and talked or written about for centuries. Just as the wise men read the evidence for the birth in the heavens, we read about the evidence for the crucifixion in Scripture. How did people respond to Yeshua ben Yosef when he came into the city? They erupted in a spontaneous display that must have freaked out more than one Roman bureaucrat. In a time when the average village was 200 to 500 men, women, and children, such a demonstration of thousands of fanatical Jews in the pressure cooker of Jerusalem must have been more than a little problematic. The word nervous doesn't even begin to describe how the Roman rulers uh, and their friends in the house of Annas, including the high priest Caiaphas, uh, must have felt. Our Lord came into Jerusalem on what we celebrate as Palm Sunday, accepting the accolades of a king. Even his diminutive mount was willingly supplied, and according to scripture, as recorded in chapter 19 of the Gospel of Luke. It was a royal, kingly entry into Jerusalem. Our Lord's previously low-profile, mobile ministry in the towns and countryside of Judea and the Galilee crossed the line here as the final days of our Abba's divine plan would be acted out on the larger stage of the holy city. There were, of course, many accolades. The Hebrews, steeped in their scriptures and traditions, were gathering for the Passover feast in Jerusalem. Our Lord's entry into the city on the back of a colt in verse 30, 36 uh, reflected the words of the prophet, O daughter of Zion, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious as he humble and riding on a colt. That's in Zechariah 9.9. 9. This wasn't lost on the pilgrims who were part of the scene. In the same way, the two disciples spread their cloaks over the colt for Jesus to ride in verse 35. The people responded spontaneously and spread their cloaks on the road as he rode along. Verse 36, they broke into praise, shouting out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 38, their thoughts were of the Messiah King a righteous and powerful protector. They were thinking of Psalm 118 written in the 11th century BC and the prophecy of the coming reign of King Solomon in 1 Chronicles chapter 17 written in the 5th century BC. To say the Hebrews had been waiting for the return of the king as it were 
for quite a while is an understatement. Jesus also knew, however, that he was to be crucified. The triumph and the glory of the resurrection had to look a lot different from before than from after. We should remember he sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, clearly under the most extreme conditions of stress. He didn't want the cup, as it were, but he took it nevertheless in complete submission to the plan our Abba had laid out. The Jews were recognizing him, but not because they understood what his mission would be. Talk about your basic good news, bad news. In any case, our Messiah wasn't taken in by the accolades of the crowd. The Master understood the magnitude of what he was doing, however. He didn't stop the outcry when some of the Pharisees in the crowd, verse 39, uh, told him to. I tell you, if they keep silent, the stones will cry out, verse 40. Our Lord reminded them here of what God said to Cain after his murder of Abel. And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. That's in Genesis 4.10. If they hadn't acknowledged the Savior as they did, their guilt would have overwhelmed them. In the verses from chapter 50 of the book of Isaiah, we hear through the prophet the words of the coming Messiah written, at least arguably, about seven centuries before his advent, they already speak of his utter faith and commitment to his Abba, no matter what transpires. He speaks already of his connection to uh, listening to and speaking for God for the proclamation of the kingdom, verse 4, of his faithfulness, verse 5, of his submission to ridicule and persecution, in verse 6, and of his focus on God as his help through, it, through all of it. Verse 7. We should notice he spoke, spoke through Isaiah of turning the other cheek seven centuries before we heard it from his own lips. The notion uh, should therefore be deeply ingrained in Christians and Jews. It is more important for each one of us that our honor and integrity be found not wanting by our Abba than that we be acclaimed worthy by the powers of this world. The verses from Psalm 22 this morning are extracted from an entire piece that speaks to us about the crucifixion of our Lord in the most graphic of terms. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, verse 2, the responsorial sporeal verse from the beginning of the psalm, seems uh, the, the definite cry of a lost soul, but it is not. The rest of Psalm 22 is almost a scientific clinical analysis from the point of view of the one being crucified of what precisely the horrible torture and death would feel like. The circumstances surrounding his crucifixion were also described over a millennium earlier rather precisely in the psalm. His nails, and the nails in his feet and his hands were predicted, verse 17, as well as the slow dislocation of his joints, verse 18, and even the soldiers gambling for his fancy robe was predicted, verse 19. By its end, verses 23 through 32, however, Psalm 22 had become a song of praise and faith. By the way, Jesus was quoting an Aramaic Targum or translation in verse 2 and not a canonical Hebrew version of the psalm. It's likely they all spoke Aramaic, the dominant lingua franca in the Middle East from the 9th century BC until it was replaced by Arabic in the 8th century AD. It would have been spoken at home and in their everyday lives. We who are followers of the way should take the advice of our Messiah as it is expressed in this psalm, verses 23 and 24. We should love our Abba, give glory to him, and revere him all the days of our lives. We should stand in the arenas of our time with our heads held high, our eyes clear and direct, 
and our voices loud and distinct. We are followers of the way, and it is our master who rules this world for the rest of time. We should do all of these things. We can ignore the historical reality suggested by the probabilities of all this coming together as it did over, over more than a millennium. But to borrow a line from my friend Alan, I'm just saying. Paul's words in chapter 2 of his epistle to the Philippians effectively summarize the psalmist's 3,000-year-old history of the crucifixion for us. They focus our attention on the obedience and faithfulness of the Master. It reminds us our Lord's ego conformed to the will of his Father, verse 6, emptying himself as a slave in human likeness and found human in appearance, verse 7, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, verse 8. God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Verse 9. He finishes verses 10 and 11 in some sense with the ringing tones of the last three verses of Psalm 22, but again with a focus on Jesus Christ and the completion of the perfectly obedient and triumphant, infinite even, incarnation of the Son of God and the second person of the Trinity. As a consequence of this, the Holy Spirit was loosed upon the whole world. Upon Paul, certainly, but upon all the rest of us, too. We remember Paul's ministry began when he was knocked off his donkey on the road to Damascus, of course. But afterwards, the Comforter uh, was always with him. Not always as he wished, and not always comforting, but always as he needed. Human beings simply can't fulfill the law on their own, and so God, Jesus Christ, did it. Even as we proclaim Jesus as our Messiah and God as our Father, we are a stiff-necked people, and we turn away willfully just when our Abba's outstretched arms are getting close to us. We need His grace to open ourselves to Him. We need the Holy Spirit to instruct us and comfort us as we close ourselves off in little cages of our own creation. The Mohammedans have it right when they have called us Trinitarians. We are Trinitarians and we must be Trinitarians. Our belief in one God is tantamount for us, just like it is for the Jews and the Muslims. Our experience of God over the millennia, the two millennium, millennia since the, the Master walked the earth is three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we take one of them away, we are not Christians. Paul himself experienced the indwelling of the Comforter and saw its work among the disciples. In any case, if we're quiet and look around, we can feel a bit of what he felt and see some of what he saw. Be still and know that I am God, oh, Psalm 46, 10, goes for all of us. This is my story and I'm sticking to it. The alternative, uh, shorter reading for today from chapter 23 of the Gospel of Luke is, I think, uh, familiar to most of us. It recounts the trial and execution of Jesus Christ in rather stark, uh, no-frills terms. Uh, Yeshua ben Joseph couldn't carry the cross the whole way, so a fellow named Simon was pressed into service to help him, verse 26. On Golgotha, no one helped. The wine they offered came with scorn, verses 36 and 37. As he asked forgiveness for them, he took his robe, cast lots for it, verse 34, and then they sat and waited for him to die. We should understand here, no one cast lots for beggar rigs. The robe of the master, apparently woven all in one piece, was a very elegant <coughs> piece of attire worth very much more than the soldiers could normally afford, and not at all to be divided. Soldiers placed a sign over him reading, The King of the Jews, verse 38. 
something on which Pontius Pilate apparently insisted as a goad to the Jewish rulers who demanded our Lord's execution. When Jesus speaks to the women who, scorn, who mourn for him, he speaks in eschatological terms, verses 28 through 31, taken from the book of the prophet Hosea, chapters 9 and 10, and written in the 8th century BC in the days before the Assyrian conquest of Samaria. The coming collapse, the Roman destruction of Jerusalem and the temple will not be any better for the children of the women to whom the master is speaking than it was for their ancestors at the time of the Assyrian conquest. A bleak picture indeed. If the green wood, Jesus, who, who is full of the sap of righteousness, is so badly treated, how much worse will it be for the dry wood, those whose faith has dried up in the coming days? Verse 31. He was crucified with criminals in verses, 30, verses 32 and 33 and ridiculously and, and ridiculed uh, mercilessly by those who could not or refused to understand what was taking place. Verses uh, 35 through 37. This included even ridicule from one of the criminals being crucified with him. Verse 39. At least the other criminal had the good sense to rebuke the fool and ask for the master's forgiveness, verses 40 through 42. For his deathbed conversion, as it were, what did he receive? Redemption and hope is what the pro Messiah promised him, verse 30, 43, and it was gold he could take to the bank. So also can we have redemption and hope. All we have to muster up are the honesty, the courage, and the humility to go ask. Go figure. When Jesus cried out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, in verse 46, the infinite incarnation ended in triumph and the new world began. As in so many other cases, our Messiah was quoting a bit of scripture. In this case, Psalm 31, verse 5. Uh, with which many observant Jews to this day end their nightly prayers. The original Hebrew for the word translated command here is afkid, and it means something slightly different than the usual English translation of it. The word has more to do with a temporary deposit for safekeeping, expecting to get it back soon in good condition, uh, than it is a recommendation of sorts. There is a certainty, a committed faith about this that we can miss in the English. Not all of this may come across as clear-cut and, and straightforward, of course. There are, in fact, many arguments that translations are inexact. As a scientist, however, I learned long ago to think in terms of probabilities. When something happens that is so improbable as to appear impossible, it isn't likely it occurred in any way consistent with our understanding of probability and stochastic processes, but it is at least possible something else was operating we don't know about. In any case, when the observed data don't fit our usual theories, we should consider changing the theories before we object the observe, reject the observed data. When the master completed the assignment, as it were, strange things began to occur. An eclipse darkened the place for three hours, <coughs> and the veil of the temple split in two, verses 44 and 45. <coughs> Pardon me. We're not talking about science fiction or fantasy here. We're talking about appearances to salt of the earth, I saw what I saw, Hebrews. Soldiers are also pretty reality-oriented folks. They know what they know and recognize without pretending when things are happening they don't understand. The centurion and the others had heard all the ridicule and knew the scourging of the Messiah had been extreme. Uh, this is for another uh, discussion, of course, but as a scientist I'm appalled at the incompetent uh, procedures followed by the ones who performed the carbon dating of the Shroud of Turin, including violating some of the basic tenets of sampling theory. Jesus, 
was so weakened he couldn't last long on the cross and in fact he did not now they saw, now they saw the darkness over the land verse 44 and heard about the veil of the temple being torn in two verse 45 uh oh however it's said in Aramaic Hebrew Greek or Latin must have been on the tongues of all of the witnesses I appreciate the honest nuts and bolts response of, uh, of the centurion, the captain of the guard, so to speak. This man was innocent beyond doubt. Verse 47. You can't last long in a battle if you can't see or won't accept the reality of what's happening before you, before you and then respond. The soldiers didn't have much to do at this point, but they knew an injustice had taken place. Can we do less, we who are the plebs sung today? I don't think so. This Palm Sunday, we acclaim Yeshua ben Yosef, the risen Christ, as our Master, our Messiah, and our Lord. This week, we try to have the right perception to see what's really important so we won't make the mistake the Jewish leadership did all those many years ago and cave to expediency to the clanging symbols and I use the word advisedly, and the noisy congestion of our t lives. This Holy Week we remember Jesus Christ and his trial, his sacrifice for all of us, and, and we await his glorious resurrection. What should be our role in this world? We remember now simply to put one foot in front of the other in our journey, in our stumbling efforts as followers of the way. We remember in each small step to choose his way over ours, a little better instead of a little worse. We choose to extend our hearts in love and our hands to help, rather than the usual stony-faced responses of disapproving, scornful, or fearful neighbors. We're all in this boat together, and no one of us knows the mind of God. Every one of us needs the Holy Spirit to comfort us and guide us. We remember God's grace, not only in the yearning of our hearts, but in the love in which he enfolds us and in the edification and the enlightenment he bestows on us. Let us be in love with those around us, regardless of how obnoxious they are. We are followers of the way, and they are all part of our family. Odd and embarrassing, and maybe even dangerous when they drive, actually, but still ours to love. The gospel is ours to spread to the entire world, and the work is not done. Let us remember we are walking, talking, hearing, and speaking mobile sacraments of healing for the whole world. We are his hands, his voice, his eyes, and his smile. Just as we see his face in those around us, they all see him in our encouragement our prayers and our actions in our help. What drives us? How else shall we act, we who are the pleb santo dei? How can we not acknowledge our God, just as the Jews did who welcomed him the first Palm Sunday? How can we not seek to please him whose passion we remember this holy week? God bless you and yours and keep you.